few experts are as credible as my guest today. He's not only a PhD in nutritional sciences, he's also a champion powerlifter. Lay Norton, welcome to the show. A lot of us hear contradictory information as to how much protein they should consume. Research studies are very messy when it comes to nutrition. Debates are kind of a waste of time because they really don't change anybody's opinion. This guy was saying that people should eat their foods raw because cooking food coagulated the protein. Now, th doesn't this kind of thing just drive you nuts? <laughs> Welcome to the Lee Lebrano Show. Welcome back, everybody. When I think about getting into great shape, I think about the need to eat right and work out as the only long-term solution. Today, we're gonna to be looking at some of the most popular diets and how they impact your ability to lose fat. We're also gonna be talking about the role of protein in helping you achieve your goals. Now, the problem is that there's so much conflicting information out there about nutrition, diets, and how it impacts fat loss and building muscle. And when it comes to cutting through all of the noise around dieting and nutrition, few experts are as credible as my guest today. He's not only a PhD in nutritional sciences and an expert in protein synthesis, he's also the author of numerous published scientific studies on protein. And if that wasn't enough, he's also a champion powerlifter who finished first at the 2022 IPF World Masters Powerlifting Championships, and he has set world records. This is a guy that not only relies on facts and research, Research. He also applies it to his own training and the thousands of clients he trains through his company, BioLane. Lane Norton, welcome to the show. Thanks, Larry. I appreciate the introduction. Lane, I know that you're getting ready for the 2023 IPF World Masters Powerlifting Championship in Scottsdale, and you're about a week out. How are you feeling? Yeah, so it's actually Nationals next weekend. I got to win that, and then if I win that, I go to uh, IPF Worlds in Mongolia in October. Um, but honestly, I feel great. Uh, last year when I won... Uh, worlds, I would say I was about 90%. Uh, I, I, went, I was really successful in powerlifting in my early 30s and mid-30s. Uh, won a couple of national titles, set a world record, and then went through quite a few injuries and kind of took me out of the sport. I mean, I would be able to do a meet here and there, but it kind of took me out for about six, seven years. And wow. um, over the last couple of years, I've have, you know, battled through uh, multiple disc herniations and torn hip muscles and, you know, typical powerlifter stuff. And uh, this is the best I've felt since uh, I was setting world records. So um, that's bad news for my competition and good news for me, which that's, I'm excited about. So that's, that's right. Uh, I'm I'm stoked to uh, get out to Scottsdale and uh, and go have some fun. Well, I got the feeling that you're going to be going to Mongolia uh, here towards uh, the the fall. And so, uh, just uh, real quick, what weight class do you compete in? And what are some of the world records that you've set? Yeah, so I compete in the IPF, which the weight classes are a little bit different than most uh, powerlifting organizations. So I compete in the 93 kilo class, which is the 205 pound class. Um, and when I set a world record in squat, um, that was in 2015 at IPF Worlds. And that was a 303 kilogram or 668 pound squat. And IPF is That's incredible. Uh, water drug tested. Uh, very, very, very strict. I got tested out of competition multiple times. So, you know, you can never really stop that stuff from happening, but they do. I mean, they are pretty serious about that sort of thing. And, um, and then we also, it is a powerlifting organization that it's basically the IFBB of powerlifting, which is it's the biggest, it's the most competitive. I think when I did IPF Worlds, there was 800 lifters uh, from 55 different countries. It was very, very competitive. So, uh, very cool to go out and do that. Now, that world record has since been broken multiple times, so it's not even – I think it's probably now like well into the 700s. So it's pretty cool to see how far people have pushed it. Well, dude, it, it, my hat's – I got – tip my hat to you because that's just incredible you know being a natural athlete and uh setting a world record like that that's just a, a, a an amazing feat so congratulations on that and i know that you're going to have an incredible year uh you know with these competitions coming up lane i'm going to start by letting our viewers know that you have a great instagram account you attack the misinformation that surrounds nutrition and expose these so-called experts that really don't know much about what they're talking about and i saw one of your posts where this guy was saying that people should eat their foods raw because cooking the food coagulated the protein, you know, which there's no <laughs> such thing. Now, th doesn't this kind of thing just drive you nuts? Yeah, you know, I think um, it's a case of, you know, some having some knowledge is actually more dangerous than having none at all. Because when you have some knowledge, you overestimate your ability to properly interpret that knowledge. 
And um, I think one of the things I heard one time, which I thought was really um, telling that I think most people don't think about, if, if two people are talking to each other, they're usually pretty good at determining on a given subject who is more knowledgeable of the two. So, um, like, if we're, you know, you owned a supplement company for a long time, you've dealt with logistics for a long time. If we're talking that stuff, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be like, yeah, I don't know. I got people for that. You know, like, I just don't know that kind of stuff. But, you know, if we're talking about, like, muscle protein synthesis or something like that, you know, something in my wheelhouse, it'll become apparent to both of us who's more knowledgeable on that subject. But if two people are debating, both of whom are more knowledgeable than we are on a subject, we are not well equipped to determine who is more knowledgeable of the two. And we see that with, that's why I told people debates are kind of a waste of time because they really don't change anybody's opinion. I mean, think about a political debate. What was the last time a political debate changed anyone's opinion, right? Right, right. So it really is very difficult to get people to recognize that that is a big blind spot. And uh, I think, like I said, some knowledge is actually way more dangerous than just pure ignorance. And a lot of times people go in there looking for confirmation of what they think is appropriate for them anyway. Uh, you're an expert in protein, obviously, and you've done numerous studies on protein, including the amino acid leucine and its role in building muscle. And our viewers know that protein is important in the muscle building process. But a lot of us hear contradictory information as to how much protein they should consume to, bu uh, to build lean muscle and how often. What, what are, is your view on that? What's the research say? So I'll give you a research answer and then I'll give you what I do. Okay. okay, because I think one thing people need to realize is research studies are very messy when it comes to nutrition. And they also, you know, when you're dealing with lean mass accrual, you're talking about small differences between small numbers. Because muscle building, especially in, in the you know, subjects in these studies are always, you know, drug free. That's a very, very slow process. So, you know, if you're looking at most of these studies, which are, you know, 8 to 16 weeks, you know, you're looking at small differences. So I'll, I'll give you the research and then I'll tell you kind of what I do. Okay. So the research would say that, you know, between 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight is basically like shown to max out, you know, uh, muscle building. And I mean, that ends up right around the old one gram per pound of body weight, you know, quote unquote rule. Um, now, there is some research, and I will say it's isolated studies, mm -hmm. where like there was one meta-regression they did where basically they showed that like up to 3.3 grams per kilogram of lean mass, so a little bit different because body weight includes lean mass and fat mass. So 3.3 uh, grams per kilogram of lean mass is probably more like you know 2.8, 2.9 grams uh, per kilogram of body mass. But... They, when they're doing what's called a meta regression, they're kind of taking numbers that they see and projecting out. So there's some disagreement in the research literature. What I'll say is I think you will get the vast, vast, vast majority of benefits from a high protein diet right around 1.6 to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight. So people now, will now say, Lane, is that lean body weight? I know there's lean muscle mass or yeah, just yeah, overall yeah. So body that weight. Was, yeah, that's just body weight, okay. what I'm referring to. But again, you know, if somebody's obese, they don't need to, you know, consume, you know, a bunch of extra protein for fat mass. Right. If we're putting it into grams per kilogram of lean mass, it's probably somewhere around like 2 to 2.8 grams per kilogram of lean mass, I would say. Okay. So that's what the research shows. What I will say is, there doesn't appear to be a downside to consuming more protein if you like protein, right? So, you know, obviously we see IFBB bodybuilders who will consume, you know, up to like four or five grams per kilogram of lean mass from protein. It's certainly not going to have like a downside on building muscle. The downsides are mostly theoretical. People have said, well, you could have kidney issues. That's, that's never really been documented in the literature that a healthy kidney is negatively affected by a high protein diet. Now, I will say there are some research studies looking at up to four grams per kilogram of lean mass. Uh, Jose Antonio did one that was about a year long. They didn't see any negative health outcomes from it. Now, it's, it's a year, so that's one thing to keep in mind. What I would say, like health-wise, we don't have real, like, it's, you can't run a randomized control trial for, you know, 
10 years or 20 years. So we've mostly got like correlation studies. I would say that even at higher protein intakes, I think there's probably not much risk. Um, if there is, a lot of these risks that are associated with higher protein intakes tend to be because people who eat higher protein and high protein in the literature is more like above 1.2 grams per kilogram. Right. They tend to get that from really like poor sources of protein, like processed sources of meats and whatnot. So they're it's getting a, a lot of fat question. too. Yeah, it's quite a different question than people who are choosing like really lean sources of protein. So here's what I'll tell you that I do. <laughs> so okay. I'm about, um, you know, just under 90 kilos of lean mass. I consume about 240 grams of protein a day. So I'm like right around like 2.5 grams per kilogram of, of lean mass. Okay. Um, okay. Is, is there a my cap? reasoning for that? No, that? Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish yeah, your point there. So my reasoning for that is, you know, I think that's maxing out the benefits of protein personally based on the research literature I've seen. Um, and I feel comfortable that there's probably not really many downsides to that. The other downside, if you get protein too high, is now it's coming at the expense of carbohydrates and fats, right? Right, right. So if you've got a, re especially if you're calorie restricted, if your fats or carbohydrates get too low, you know, carbohydrates can impact, um, you know, training intensity. Um, and then uh, also there's some evidence that insulin and carbohydrates stimulate insulin can reduce muscle protein degradation. Um, and then fats are needed for, you know, healthy hormone production, that sort of thing. So I, I do think, you know, if you want to go up to like three grams per kilogram of, of lean mass, I think that's totally fine. I don't think there's really a downside to that, especially if you enjoy protein and the satiety benefits as well. Is there a cap to how much muscle building that you can get from one feeding of protein? Yeah. So, I mean, if we look at that, we're kind of looking at acute studies on muscle protein synthesis. And what that suggests is it's anywhere from 20 to 40 grams at a meal. Uh, and that cap tends to depend on like the source of protein. So, for example, if you're looking at like a really high quality protein source like whey, which is high in leucine, I mean, you're going to hit that cap like, you know, 20 grams of protein is going to be fine. Now, people will say, what if I'm 250 pounds and got a lot of lean mass? Well, yeah, then it's maybe a little bit higher, but it's not, you know, double. Um, and then when you look at like plant-based sources of protein, especially intact plant proteins, you know, you... I want to be clear, you can build muscle on a plant-based protein. We've seen bodybuilders who are plant-based and, and do well, um, but you just need a little bit more protein to do it. So um, in, in, especially in intact proteins, like uh, if you're talking about like, let's say you're trying to get 40 grams of protein from like kidney beans or something like that, the protein is bound up in fibrous plant material. And so it's not accessible or it's not as accessible to digestive enzymes. Um, now, if you're talking about isolated sources of plant protein, like pea protein, uh, soy protein, you know, those sorts of things, those don't have the problems with digestibility. It's just that they tend to be a little bit lower in leucine. So for those, you're probably looking at like 30 grams, you know, to max out muscle protein synthesis, that sort of thing. But I do think that most people make too big of a deal about, you know, I used to be one of them. I used to say, you know, plant protein, is trash protein, you know, you're not going to build muscle on that. Now, you know, the research seems to show you can build plenty of muscle on plant protein, but if you want the highest quality protein source, it's probably whey and then some of the other animal sources. But if you get an isolated source of plant protein, it's probably fine as well. Now, I will say this is just looking at muscle protein synthesis, and the building of muscle is the balance between synthesis and degradation. Good point. So it's synthesis minus degradation. So this isn't really taking into account what happens with degradation. And the reason that is, is because degradation is very, very, very difficult to measure. Mm -hmm. um, so us scientists kind of hide our heads in the sand and just go, well, synthesis does this. So we think right. that's good enough. But um, I do want to put the caveat that it's not considering degradation. And that could that could change things theoretically. It's, it's a reminder to all of us that lift uh, weights on a regular basis that uh, that there is, um, you know, mus muscle tissue breakdown, protein degradation, and and whatnot uh, with the lifting, and uh, you you can easily uh, overtrain, you know, which as we know is uh, counterproductive. Lane, I've heard about people doing protein cycling. Um, what do you think about that? You know, cutting back the protein for several days and then increasing it again. They, they say that you get a benefit. Is there good science behind that? Uh, there's not really any science behind that, to be honest. Um, 
you know, I think people came to this idea like because people do carb cycling or people cycle like other things. So they're right. like, well, let's cycle protein. Um, I don't really see, I don't really see there being a theoretical benefit to that. And the reason being, uh, I could see a theoretical benefit if when you are consuming, um, higher protein, if your body becomes desensitized to that and you don't have as robust of a muscle protein synthetic response, but we don't really see that in the research study. So if we take people who have been chronically consuming high protein and have them eat a high protein meal, they still get about what we'd expect from a muscle protein synthetic response. So I don't really see the benefit to doing that. Maybe there's something you know out there that would be a benefit, but I, I can't really see it based on our current scientific understanding. I think it's kind of people trying to come up with something new and fancy and reinvent the wheel. That's, that's, that was my take on it. I, I, the first thing that I thought when I saw the term protein cycling, oh, okay, they're trying to basically extrapolate what they're doing with uh, carbohydrates, you know, uh, cutting carbohydrates and loading carbohydrates. And, you know, it probably doesn't work in the same way. Will you talk a little bit about the thermic effect of food and more specifically the thermic effect of protein? Yeah, so if we think about um, when you eat food, you don't just access that energy immediately. You have to digest it, you have to assimilate it, and then you have to metabolize it. And the process of metabolism is the process of extracting energy in the form of ATP out of the food we eat. Now, it's a very long, convoluted process for people who haven't studied it. Um, but essentially, in order to get out the energy from food, your body has to put energy in. So it's kind of like, I mean, it's a bad comparison, but it's a comparison. It's kind of like your internal combustion engine, right? So you don't just put gas or petrol in your car engine or in your tank, and then your car spontaneously starts up. You have to use, you have to use, uh, your, you have to use the ignition and a battery because you have to put in energy to then extract energy out of that fuel that's in your tank. Nutrition works kind of the same way where when you're trying to get f uh, fuel from the food that you ate, your body has to put energy in. Now, you always get out more energy than you put in. There are no negative calorie foods, contrary to popular belief. Some people will say things like celery or, or negative calorie, that sort of thing. That mm -hmm. No, celery is very low calorie. The net calories on celery, I think it's like 550 calories per kilogram. So you can eat a kilogram of celery and right. it's 50 calories. <laughs> so it's, it's very low, but it's always a net positive. So uh, when it comes to protein, if we look at the other macronutrients, like I want to be clear, it does depend on kind of the individual source of food. But if we look at macronutrient spreads, um, so for example, dietary fat, the TEF is about 0 to 3%, meaning if you eat 100 calories from dietary fat, you net about 97 to 100 calories. For a carbohydrate, it's about 5 to 10%. So if you eat 100 calories from carbohydrate, you're netting about 90 to 95 calories. And then if you eat 100 calories from protein, the TEF is about 20 to 30%. So you're only netting about 70 to 80 calories out of that. And the reasoning for that doesn't appear to be anything to do with digestion or assimilation of that protein. Uh, it's because protein stimulates muscle protein synthesis, which protein synthesis itself requires energy. So that process in and of itself is actually somewhat thermogenic. So, um, yeah, the anabolic capacity of protein is also why it tends to be uh, kind of thermogenic as well. That's very, very interesting. See, I always thought it was because uh, of, of the uh, metabolism, the actual uh, breaking down and processing of, of the protein. Lane, there's a number of diets out there. Um, uh, as you know, they're almost too numerous to even mention by name, but some of the more common ones are the keto diet and intermittent fasting. How do you feel about intermittent fasting, uh, reduced feeding windows? Any benefit to that? So the, the benefit, and this is going to get me in trouble with the fasting camps, but the benefit to fasting appears to be that for some people, not all, but for some people, they just don't really get hungry during that fasting window and they don't compensate by overeating outside of it. So for some people, it's a really good tool to restrict calories. Now, unfortunately, and you mentioned this earlier, uh, selection bias. Unfortunately, when we find a tool that works for us, we tend to want to validate ourselves as to why that tool That's is right. the best tool in existence. So, um, and for example, I did this as well. So I, I follow what I kind of call flexible dieting, which is basically I have my macronutrients that I want to hit for the day. 
and I have my fiber target, and then however I want to fill that up, I, I kind of you know do it that way. Now, if you're hitting if you're hitting macronutrient ratios that are conducive to body composition, by default you're going to select a lot of you know healthy foods. But if I want like a bowl of ice cream or something like that, it I, I fit it into my macros and I don't really worry about it. I move on with my life. But I was first getting into bodybuilding. Well, I found the reason I got on this, and I promise I'll bring it back to fasting. The reason I got on this was. Uh, I found that I would try to eat clean all the time and I would just end up like binge eating whenever I got exposed to food that was off my diet plan. And so I kind of had this epiphany. is like, well, you know, it's probably not a slice of pizza that's killing my progress. It's probably the fact that I eat the whole thing, you know? <laughs> so I just started like tracking my calories, tracking my macros and hitting those. And I got really consistent results. And I found I could modify my body composition however I wanted you know, I did a contest prep in 2010 where I won my first uh, uh, drug-tested pro show. And I had, you know, a small bowl of ice cream pretty much every day leading into that competition. Now, I thought this is the answer for everybody. This is easy for me. Therefore, everyone's going to want to do it. And what I found was also selection bias. The clients that were coming to me were coming to me already sold on flexible dieting because it's what I talked about. So they were already biased towards that. So in the case of fasting, I think what happens a lot of times is people find that tool that works for them and then they automatically start, they start talking about it. People come to them wanting to do fasting, biased towards it, and they go, well, look at all my clients that have gotten great results. Yeah, but what about all the people who didn't who tried it, right? Now, what I will say for fasting is, um, you know, I think if you're a somebody who is wanting to max out your muscle building, I don't think it's optimal. Now, you can still build muscle on it because there's some really nice research studies uh, from Grant Tinsley. I think he's at Texas A&M, where they looked at kind of the traditional 16-8 fasting, so 16-hour fast, 8-hour feeding window, and they compared that to continuous meal feeding uh, in people who were resistance training for 12 weeks and found that both groups gained the same amount of muscle. That's and, interesting. And that was, uh, I think there was, I think there was two different studies on that. Now I want to put a few important caveats up there. A sixteen eight uh, fast is not a very extreme fast. Right. Um, and, and they made sure that they had three protein containing meals in there, so three high protein meals, hmm. and they put the training inside of their feeding window. So let's so say that. How, I was just going to. Sorry to interrupt you there. I was just going to ask. You know. If you're a bodybuilder, will you lose muscle or experience negative consequences in your body composition if you do this? So it appears to not negatively impact fat loss. People lose just as much fat. Hmm. Uh, in some studies, they lose more lean mass. Yeah. But that tends to be with the more extreme versions of fasting, like, you know, like kind of over 20 hours of fasting at a time or alternate day fasting. Okay. Now, what I will say is I still wouldn't say that 16-8 is optimal. Um, I just, I think that, you know, 12 weeks is a pretty short period of time to pick out differences. And so if you inject me with truth serum, I would say that, like, if you're a bodybuilder, I don't think any form of fasting is your best option. Um, if you are somebody who's just looking to build muscle and you don't care about being, like, the most muscular human being you possibly can, like, you know, me and you, um, then I think, you know, 16, eight fasting is probably fine. You know, you're, you're probably not leaving like what you're leaving on the table is the last, you know, one, two, three percent. Right. But for guys like us, if we're competing, that is exactly where we live. Right. right. Like, Cause that is the difference between first and 10th. Got to have it. So, um, I think it depends on the population you're talking about, but for the average person, I'm not really worried about muscle loss with fasting unless you're doing like one of the more extreme forms of fasting. hundred percent. Now, how much of success in intermittent fasting do you think might be the product of improved compliance? In other words, the ability to consistently stick with the diet program. Compliance is everything when it comes to nutrition. Like it, like it, it, it's literally the thing. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't get nearly as talked about as much as it should. I'm glad you brought it up uh, because it's just not sexy, right? People go, oh, well, just adhere to the diet. Like just... Like that's easy, right? Like that's like saying, well, most Americans can't write a $5,000 check and are in debt. So just earn more money than you spend, bro. That's, it's that easy. Well, no, it's not that easy because 
And it's not just about income either because there's plenty of people who make over six figures who are dead broke or in serious amounts of debt. So it's not a head knowledge problem. It's a behavior problem. That's Agreed. the issue. I would say that a lot of dieting really is rooted in behavior. So it's as much a psychological thing as anything. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, people will ask me like, well, you know, you track your macros. Like it's, un it's unsustainable to just take a food scale everywhere for the rest of your life. I, I kind of agree, you know, but I don't take a food scale everywhere. But I did for a while. And let me tell you, when I did that, it really opened my eyes to what I actually ate, right? So first of all, when I was young, I was very skinny and had trouble gaining muscle. And when I wasn't tracking my calories, I was like, you know, I, I'm just a hard gainer. I've, I'm eating 3,500, 4,000 calories a day. And then I actually weighed out everything I put in my mouth and I was eating 2,400 calories a day, <laughs> you know, on average. Now, I would have days where I hit 4,000 and then the next day I'd have like 1,600, you know? <laughs> right. So I started getting consistent with that. And then with a lot of my clients... I've even had this, I had a gal, I'll never forget this. She swore up and down she was eating uh, 1,400 calories a day. Well, the first thing we found out was she was doing volume measurements. So cups of oats, tablespoon of peanut butter. Just based off that alone, she was eating 1,000 calories more per day than she thought she was. Wow. Right? Because if you ever want to be depressed, go and weigh out a tablespoon of peanut butter <laughs> and you'll find that it's two to three times the serving size in terms of weight. <laughs> Same thing for ice cream. People go, oh, half a cup. Okay, well, uh, that's about half a cup. And yep. it's actually three times the, the amount. Same yeah. thing for even oatmeal, cereal, everything. So um, then she didn't realize, oh, I'm eating this. I'm eating these calories during the week, but on the weekend I'm not tracking. And we did her nutrition of her salad that she was eating, of, you know, all this kind of stuff. And she was eating like 3,200 calories a day on the weekends, right? Wow, yeah. Didn't realize it. Yeah. And here's the other thing. She was, she was like, well, you know, I drink sometimes, but it's all hard liquor. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't get any carbs in. I'm like, yeah, but that hard liquor still has calories. You betcha. You know, even if you're just doing shots of vodka, a shot of vodka has 64 calories in it. Yeah, and alcohol does some weird things in your body. Right, and, and, and if you're doing like five shots of vodka, there's no carbohydrates in it, but you're getting 300 calories that you didn't That's even right. realize you were consuming. That's right. So I think a lot of people aren't really aware or mindful, and if you're going to lose body fat, you have to restrict somehow, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's tracking calories, limiting your feeding window, or doing some form of dietary restriction, like for example, low carb or whatnot, but you have to restrict something. But what I will say is you get to pick the form of restriction. Right. And what you should do is pick the form of restriction that feels the least restrictive for you and understand that what feels less restrictive for you may not feel less restrictive for other people. This is a key point, guys. I know for me, if I track my food, and if you tell me I can track my food and eat whatever I want, uh, it's pretty easy for me to get lean until it gets to a certain point. And then, you know, once you get below a certain body fat, it's just a nightmare no matter what you're doing. But for some people, they say, you know, I cut out carbs and I didn't miss it at all. Felt easy. Didn't even feel like I was dieting, you know. Same thing for intermittent fasting. People say, you know, I didn't even notice, you know, the feeding window sort of thing. Uh, I never even felt hungry. So whatever feels easy for the individual is probably what they should do. So Lane, um, I want to talk a little bit about the ketogenic diet, and then uh, and then I'd like to go on and, and talk a little bit about BioLane. Uh, can you explain what the ketogenic diet is to us and what your views are on that program? Sure. So a ketogenic diet is a very low carbohydrate, uh, moderate protein, really, and high fat. Um, and what happens is when your carbohydrates get low enough uh, on a biochemical level, you can't regenerate oxalo acid in a TCA cycle. I'm getting really biochemical here. And basically that starts leading to an accumulation of acetyl-CoA, which is uh, acetyl-CoA is what enters the Krebs cycle. When you have an accumulation of acetyl-CoA, um, you can turn that into ketones in the liver. And so a low carb diet will start producing ketones and ketones can be a fuel for the brain and the muscle as well. And they can spare carbohydrate because you do need a certain amount of glucose per day, about 120 grams uh, for your red blood cells and central nervous system to function. Now, 
the ketones, you can, you, your liver can produce that much carbohydrate with no carbohydrate intake, fortunately. Uh, and ketones will help spare that carbohydrate so that it can help you function. So the ketogenic diet has actually been used uh, therapeutically for, uh, for example, epilepsy. There's actually really good evidence That's right. that a ketogenic diet will reduce the incidence of seizures. Uh, it's been used very effectively for that. Um, and it does have some satiety benefits. Uh, ketones tend to improve satiety. Now, it, the question should always be compared to what? Um, I would argue that a, a carbohydrate-based diet that's high in fiber is more satiating than a ketogenic diet on a calorie-per-calorie calorie level. But some people, just based on their lifestyle, the foods they like to consume, do really well on a ketogenic diet. Now, that's led to claims that because you burn so much fat on a ketogenic diet, that it's better for fat loss. The problem is fat loss is not the same thing as fat burning, and people mix the two up. Mm -hmm. Fat loss is the balance between the amount of fat you store versus the amount of fat you burn. Think same thing for muscle building, right? Muscle building is the balance between synthesis and degradation. Both things always occur at the same time. It's the relative rates of each that determine how much is going to be deposited. So when it comes to fat loss, if you're on a low-fat diet, you will absolutely burn a lot of fat. But you're also eating a lot of fat, so you're, and your body doesn't real, really store carbohydrate as fat to any appreciable degree. It's like less than 2% of what winds up in adipose is from carbohydrate. So it mostly stores dietary fat. So on a ketogenic diet, yes, you're burning a lot of fat, but you're also storing a lot of fat. On a low-fat diet, high-carb diet, you're not burning much fat, but you're also not storing much fat. And so what boils down to how much you will lose or gain will depend on energy balance. And there was a really nice uh, meta-analysis done by a researcher named Kevin Hall in 2017 where he took, I think it was like 22 studies, 20 or 22 studies, where they equated calories and protein. And the other caveat to this study was all the meals were provided to the participants, which is really important because that takes adherence way up. And we know in free living studies that people's adherence is all over the place. So they equated calories, equated protein, which is important because we know protein is thermogenic, and provided all the meals to make sure adherence was good. And they looked at varying the amount of carbohydrate and fat. And what they found was practically there was no difference between low-carb and high-carb diets when they equated calories and protein, which to me I think is a great thing because it basically says, hey, do whatever you like, whatever you prefer. That will work. So a ketogenic diet will work perfectly well. I will say in short-term studies, they do see a little bit more loss of nitrogen and possibly lean mass on a ketogenic diet, but that's confounded by sometimes those were lower in protein. So there needs to be more research done on that. Um, but I would say that Very for maintaining muscle, carbohydrates are probably a good thing because they spare protein and they may inhibit muscle protein degradation. There was a study from... 2004 by Tipton, where they showed that uh, post-workout carbohydrates did not increase muscle protein synthesis, but they improved net protein balance because they decreased protein breakdown. So I still think carbohydrate is important if you want to max out muscle. That's so interesting. Now, why is it, last question, why is it that when someone starts to cut back calories, it seems that their body adapts and a further cutting calories is required in order to lose more body fat? Is it because their metabolism is slowing down or is it something else? So there's a couple different aspects to it. So you have your total daily energy expenditure, which consists of your basal metabolic rate, your metabolism, uh, your TEF, which we talked about, yeah, and your physical activity. And physical activity falls into two buckets, your exercise and then what's called non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which are basically like, like what I'm doing with my hands here, like small subconscious movements that I'm not aware of fidgeting, pacing, that sort of thing. And NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, NEAT actually accounts for a lot of calories we expend on a daily basis. Now, mm. when you start a diet, um, they've shown that a 10% weight loss can reduce your basal metabolic rate by about 15%, okay? But it could also reduce your NEAT by about four or 500 calories a day. So let's take me, for example. Right now at uh, about 210 pounds, uh, my maintenance calories or what maintains my body weight, my total daily energy expenditure is about 33, 3,400 calories a day. 
If I, in my basal metabolic rate I've had measured, it's about 1,900, but let's call it 2,000 just to make it easy numbers. Um, so if I lost 15% off my BMR, that takes out 300 calories. But then if I lose 400 calories from NEAT, which, Lee, as you probably know, when you were deep into contest prep, you probably didn't feel like moving a whole lot, right? <laughs> like no, you're so no, fatigued and tired. So yes. your NEAT goes down. That's 700 yes. calories. So all the su- so after 10% weight loss, and this happens gradually over time. It doesn't happen like all at once. But I end up in a place where 2,700 calories, which was a, a pretty good deficit for me when I started, is now actually my maintenance. And so you have to make further deficits to do that. And so that's... You know, that's just part of dieting. There's not, we don't really know of ways to really stop that. Um, you know, like being mindful of your steps. So may, maybe, so you just, you know, if your steps are going down, like tracking those. Right, that, those are great. Um, and then trying to equalize that if you're seeing your steps go down because you're not pacing or fidgeting as much. Um, but it just seems to be a natural phenomenon. And, and part of it honestly is protective to prevent you from starving. So, um, you know, it's a good thing in terms of survival, but it kind of sucks when it comes to, you know, contest prep and losing body. It, it, it does. And, and the body's, the body's uh, you know, first uh, uh, priority is to survive, as we all know. Lane, thank you so much. This is great information. Let's talk about some of the projects and businesses that you're involved in. You have BioLane. Tell us about BioLane. So BioLane encompasses, like, I've, I've written a few books. Those fall under the BioLane banner and our coaching team. So I don't do much one-on-one coaching myself anymore, but I've got a team of about a dozen coaches. They're all very well credentialed. Uh, we taught them in the bio lane way and we service, uh, I think we'll service over 2000 clients this year. So that's amazing. Really, really great for, for one-on-one coaching. They're, they're excellent coaches. Uh, and obviously like myself and my coaching director, Samantha, we oversee everything to make sure that, you know, that it is being shown the bio lane way. Um, and then what I'm really excited about actually is I just launched a coaching academy for coach, for people who want to learn basically how to coach people to lose body fat and gain muscle. Oh, that's and great. And we're calling that physique, physique coaching academy. And that's myself and professor Bill Campbell at USF. And it is a eight month, uh, mentorship program where you're getting like a textbook. Our textbooks, like over 600 pages of information, uh, you're getting Bill and I giving lectures uh, with slides, and we're doing weekly mentorship calls with our students, whether it's myself, Bill, or one of our team, uh, to really make sure that we're helping them become the best coaches they can be. Because, Lee, one of the things I saw when I was coaching a lot of people and competing was just how much horrible coaching there was mm, yes. and how badly it really impacted people. And so what I want to do is actually like, I think about how can I make the biggest impact? Well, to me, it's impacting the people that can then go make an impact on a thousand people, right? So if I can if I can do that, that is, I think, my best bet. So Physique Coaching Academy is live. We've just started taking students and the feedback so far has been phenomenal. So we're really excited about that. It's basically, I would say, the equivalent of getting a, an associate's degree and teaching people how to lose fat and build muscle. That sounds sounds like an incredible, an incredible course. And there you go, guys. You should go check that out. Now, where should people go to find out more about BioLane and the academy and the services that you offer? Yeah, the best place is BioLane.com. It's my hub for everything. Um, and then we've also even got a nutritional coaching app called Carbon Diet Coach, which is 10 bucks a month. And it basically is an algorithm-based coaching service. So, you know, even for people who can't afford one-on-one coaching, I still want to be able to help them. So that's how we produce that. We've got tens of thousands of users that are very happy. But BioLane.com is the best place to find it. And um, if you go to my Instagram, actually, if you're on Instagram, at BioLane, and then the link in my bio takes you to where all the services and products I offer are. And that's BioLane, B-I-O-L-A-Y-N-E, correct? That is correct. Great. Hey, Lane, great job today. And thank you so much for answering our questions and for joining me. Help us grow the Lee Labrada Show by sharing this podcast with one of your friends and be sure to hit the subscribe button. All right, you guys, stay motivated, get up and look up. God bless you. The Lee Labrada Show. Voices in my